Good morning. Nice to see all of you here. And we uh, hope you all have a nice Labor Day weekend. Labor Day, uh, Labor Day weekends are always uh, interesting in that it's a nice weekend, but by the same token, uh, kind of signals the end of summer and, uh, you know, some of those things. So today we, uh, today we uh, focus on how God uh, wants to use our lives. I call your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. There are a number of them there. Uh, one is that Kindred Souls meets on uh, this, uh, the second Wednesday of the month for a luncheon. Uh, so you can pay attention to that announcement. Also, uh, most importantly probably, is that choir will resume uh, regular rehearsals beginning uh, Thursday, September 5th, which is this Thursday. So if any of you sitting out there want to dust off your voices and join these folks up here, I'm sure you would receive a warm welcome. I believe that's it for announcements, unless I'm missing any. Uh, one would, the only one that I might be missing is to remind you that there is a box in the back uh, if, in case you would like to bring anything to uh, help with the birdhouse out here. Uh, so. Let us worship God together. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Let us worship. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us be happy and find joy in it. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us give thanks to all to for it. Join me in the prayer of adoration. O oh God, who has put a song in our hearts, we give you thanks for every voice that praises you, 
for the sunshine, the changing of seasons, and for every act of human kindness. We thank you that above all the bewilderments of the human world rises the eternal assurance that you, O oh God, are the spirit of eternal God, that you have better things in store for your sons and daughters that we could ever ask or desire. Lord, as we pray to you and worship you this day, put in our hearts the song of hope and assurance and the praise that comes only from knowing you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please pause in silence as we think through what we all just said aloud. seated. Does Alice want to come? Alice, you want to come down and talk for a minute? is coming too. <laughs> Come on, Otto. We're up here. We're all going to be together. There we go. Everybody's here now. I have something for you today, and it's a picture. How about that? Do you know what it is? A bee. A bee. Yes, it's a bee. Here, Grandpa, you can have one, too. <laughs> so, do you, like, do you know what honey is? Do you eat honey? You don't know what honey is. They do eat honey. Okay. So, do you see have any bees in your yard? Do you see bees, like, around the flowers and things? Yes? Yes, yeah, sometimes. So, what I wanted to tell you was that there are all different kinds of bees. Some of the bees go out, and those are the ones that you see there out at the flowers, you know? Those are, those are yes, the flowers. And they are called, uh, they, they are called foragers. They go out and they forage for the pollen and the things that they make into honey. And they bring the pollen back to the hive Yes, and then the worker bees take over, okay? I'm sorry? How do they, they carry the pollen to, to the I think they carry it on their legs. I don't know. Anybody know about I see some heads shaking over here. Becky's uh, shaking her head. She says they carry it on their legs. That's kind of crazy, huh? Can you carry anything on your legs? No. Yeah, but bees can. And God made them kind of different than us, huh? That's a good thing. So, and then whenever they get back to the, when they get back to the hive, the worker bees take over and they make the honeycombs. And then in addition to that, there's the queen bee. You know what the queen is, huh? Queen bee is like, she's like the big boss bee, right? Queens are the big boss. And uh, she, she takes care of everything else. She has, she has babies and uh, she uh, takes care of the hive 
and she does all kind of important things. So what I wanted to tell you today was, now, right now, we see bees around, right? If you went to your yard today, in your flower, your grandma's or your, your mommy's flower garden, you would see some bees. In December, you won't see any bees around because it's cold out and bees don't like cold, right? But God has provided for bees in that uh, he has given the ability to make the honey which they can live with all, all winter long. And God gives each of us special abilities and special talents which we can do things with. So, that's kind of it. I would just wanted you to have a picture of a bee. You could take it when you go with Miss Vicky. Maybe she has a yellow crayon or a black crayon. Or if she has other things for you to do, then you can take it home with you and you can color it there. Okay? It's for you to color. Okay? All right, off you go with Miss Vicky. Thanks for coming, Otto and Alice and Grandpa. Thank you. <laughs>
Please join me in the prayer for God's wisdom and understanding. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. The first lesson today is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, the parable of the barren fig tree. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig round it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Be to God. The Gospel of uh, Mark contains a similar parable. Uh, this parable was told by Jesus um, after Palm Sunday. They'd come into the city, you know, Palm Sunday happened. And uh, after Palm Sunday came the cleansing of the temple where he went into the temple and drove out the money changers. And uh, so then this happens uh, the day after that, so you kind of know the context of where it is. It says, in, in the morning, Jesus and the, the disciples were going along and they saw a fig tree. And it was, it was withered from the root. Peter remembered and said, oh, I messed that up really bad. The next day they were leaving Bethany. Jesus was hungry. And in the distance he saw a fig tree and leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. Because it was not the season, for fruit, figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say this. In the morning, the next day, they were going along and they saw that fig tree withered from the root. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Hmm. May God bless these words to our lives. Some of you, a few of you, are perhaps too young to remember him. A few of you may have never seen him, but almost all of us in this room remember who I think was the funniest person to ever appear on late night TV. For years, late night TV was ruled by one of the funniest comedians that I've ever watched, and of course his name was Johnny Carson. Yes, Johnny Carson. And of all the characters that Johnny used to play, and all the bits that he used to do, my favorite was absolutely Karnak the Magnificent. Some of you remember Karnak? Yeah. Karnak the Magnificent. For those of you who don't know, you've lived deprived lives. For those of you who do not know Karnak the Magnificent, 
He was a Middle Eastern mind reader who wore this big showy turban and who had the ability to listen to the answer to a question and by the power of his magnificent mind, he could tell you what the question was. Karnak was hilarious. When I knew that he was going to be on TV, I would stay up for the Johnny Carson show no matter what time I had to get up the next day. One of the funniest things that Karnak used to do was Karnak used to issue curses. When the audience didn't laugh at his jokes, or when the audience booed his jokes, Karnak would look sternly at the audience and he would issue a curse at them. For example, may the fleas of a pack of wild dogs infest your mother's beard. Or, may 1,000 llamas dance on the hood of your new car. For Karnak and for Johnny and for the audience, the issuing of curses was one of the funniest parts of the whole skit. And it was the thing that brought about the greatest amount of laughter. But in the centuries before Jesus Christ, in the centuries before Jesus Christ, the issuing of curses was serious business. It was a common practice in those days long, 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 long ago for people to ask the gods to harm or to hurt or to even destroy their enemies. The wishing of evil upon others was commonplace in the Middle East in Jesus' time. But it was, in fact, a practice which Jesus vehemently opposed and disapproved of. In fact, in your Bible, you will find that Jesus said, Bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. And yet how contrary are the actions of Jesus in the passage that I just read. Far from being patient and compassionate and loving, in this passage, it kind of portrays Jesus as impatient and petulant, uh, maybe a little cranky, and kind of vindictive. In this passage, Jesus appears to be um, maybe mean. I mean, he walks up to that poor little fig tree, and because it has no figs on it for him to eat, he lays a curse on it, saying, may no one ever eat any fruit from you again. And the poor little thing, overnight, withered up and died. How unlike Jesus, how unlike Jesus this incident is. Because if you think back over his life and his ministry, Time and time again, uh, Jesus refused to use his power for his own good. For example, if you will remember, he refused to turn stones into bread. After he had been out in the wilderness for a long, long time and must have been very, very hungry. He refused to use his own power for his own good. On the night of his betrayal, when they came and grabbed him, we were going to drag him off to be crucified, he, he refused to use his power for his own good. And yet in this situation, he destroys a poor little fig tree because it cannot give him what he wants. To make matters worse, 
To make matters worse, the tree that Jesus attacked was one of the best known and one of the best loved trees in, in all of the Middle East, the fig tree. Indeed, the fig tree in the Middle East is kind of like the apple tree here in America. It was a tree that was especially loved. It was a tree that was especially favored in those times when Jesus lived. It was kind of a symbol of, of health and wealth and prosperity and all that was good. The tree itself was quite beautiful. In fact, it grew to a height of about 30, 15 to 30 feet, and it had branches that spread out about 15 to 30 feet. And so it was important that it not only gave figs, but it also gave shelter from the blistering Middle Eastern sun. Thus the fig tree, the fig tree was particularly loved, not only for what it symbolized, but also for the fruit, the nutrition, and the shade that it produced. But here's where the fig tree was a little different. Unlike most trees, unlike most trees who produce fruit once a year, the fig tree produces fruit twice a year. First, it produces fruit on the old growth from the year before, even before it has leaves and new growth for the summer. This usually happens in May or June. But most of these figs will fall to the ground and rot and become fertilizer for the soil. When Jesus was going into Jerusalem, it was not September. The fig tree does not produce good fruit until September. The point is that if Jesus had cursed a fig tree for not having figs on it in April, which is the time that the Bible says the Passover was being celebrated, then he was cursing it for not, not doing the impossible. No figs were ever produced in April. Okay, you've been patient and you've listened to all of that. So what's the point? So what's the point of the parable that Jesus gave? To, under, understand the, the, to understand the point of this story, we need to remember that Jewish teachers of Jesus' day often used symbolic actions to teach lessons to people. They often acted out what they were trying to teach. And it's most likely, it's most likely that that's what Jesus was doing on that day. He was acting out a lesson that words could not adequately communicate. So the question remains, the question remains, what was the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach? What was he trying to say? What did he want the disciples to understand. Here's what biblical scholars tend to say. Biblical scholars tend to agree that the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach 
in both the scripture lesson that Susan read and the scripture lesson that I read. The lesson that he was trying to teach was that uselessness invites disaster. Uselessness invites disaster. What an appropriate lesson for us to ponder on this Labor Day weekend. Uselessness invites disaster. It's a lesson that Jesus was trying to teach the people of Israel who had failed to carry out their God-given task to be a faithful people. But it's also a lesson that applies to us today as well. Uselessness invites disaster. Think about it. When a business or an industry fails to have a purpose in society, it usually does not take very long for it to go out of business, right? If a business no longer fulfills a purpose, let's use this for an example. I don't know all about Uniontown, but my guess is that if I looked all over Uniontown, I would find no factories that currently manufacture uh, wagon wheels, appropriate for buckboards and stagecoaches. Those have probably gone out of business a long time ago because they're useless. You can think about other things as well. That's just what comes to my mind off the top of my head. When a business or industry fails to fulfill a purpose in society, it's not usually in business for very long. And the same is true of customs and traditions. When certain customs and certain traditions become superfluous, sooner or later they are eliminated. I want to say to you men in the church this morning, where are your hats? And where are your ties? We don't do that anymore. In the 50s, my dad wouldn't have thought of going to church without a hat or a tie. When certain traditions, certain customs become superfluous, sooner or later they're eliminated. Because, as Jesus said, uselessness invites disaster. And when a church, any church, or the church in general, when the church fails to fulfill the purpose for which Jesus Christ created it, namely to be the body of Christ in the world, if and when the church fails to fulfill its purpose, it invites disaster. And when we as disciples fail to fulfill the purpose to which God has called us, we invite disaster. Story. Several years ago, several years of, uh, after several years of fishing just off the coast of Florida, the shrimp boats moved to a different location. 
They stopped fishing off the coast of Florida. Not much later, people began to find hundreds of dead seagulls in the water and on the beach and in their neighborhoods. The cause was mysterious and the people were puzzled until one wise scientist realized that over the years, the seagulls had become used to feeding off the unwanted shrimp that were thrown overboard by the shrimp fishermen. The result was that the seagulls had forgotten how to fish and to scavenger for their food. They had forgotten to do that for which they were created. The gulls had forsaken their job for which they were created in favor of the easy life. And as Jesus taught, such uselessness invites disaster. This being true, this being true, it seems logical, at least to me, that the opposite can also be said. That usefulness, usefulness, invites blessing. Usefulness invites happiness. Usefulness invites joy. Listen to this illustration of a woman that determined to be useful and the results of her determination. The author writes, when illness faced me or forced me to spend a week in the hospital, I was delighted to have those days brightened by get well cards that had been sent every other day or so by a lady that I didn't even know, but who worked in a local card store. When I got well again, I paid a visit to the card shop to thank this thoughtful stranger. Oh, there's no need to thank me, she said. My puzzled expression led her to explain. Retired and working to augment her social security, she became concerned when the store owner told her that if business did not improve, he was gonna have to lay her off. That's when I began to buy a dozen or so cards each week and to send them to names of, that I found in the local paper under births, deaths, and hospital admissions. She continued, now I work overtime because people like you stop by to thank me every day and they usually leave having made a few purchases. In her desire to be useful, the lady not only kept her job, but she found a new sense of happiness in being a blessing to others. Usefulness invites blessing and prosperity and happiness. I don't know how many of you folks uh, memorized or are familiar with the Shorter Catechism. Shorter Catechism says, what is the chief purpose of mankind? And the answer is, the chief purpose, our chief purpose, is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Think about that, folks. Our chief purpose in life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The question that I hope that we will ask ourselves, the question I intend to work on in quiet time myself this Labor Day weekend, 
is in what way am I fulfilling the purposes for which God created me? In what way am I fulfilling the purposes for which God created me? Because uselessness invites disaster while usefulness invites blessing. Everyone here, everyone in this sanctuary, everyone who's looking on YouTube, everyone who's listening on the radio, from the weakest, sickest person to the strongest, healthiest person, from the from the wealthiest person to the poorest person, from the most talented person to the least talented person, has been created by God for a purpose. Our task, your task, my task, our task is to discover the purpose for which God has created to us and to set about the task of fulfilling it. Let me just say as a side note that that purpose does change as we go through life. My purpose is not what it was 30 years ago. Some of those purposes have grown up and moved on. You know what I mean? But our task is to discover and to set about the task of fulfilling the purpose for which God has created us. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church. He was created by God for the purpose of teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ and about the Christian faith. Listen to this, it's amazing. In 40 years of ministry, he is thought to have traveled 240,000 miles on horseback. He was a circuit rider. He is thought to have preached 40,000 sermons and to have written 400 books and to have learned 10 different languages. At the age of 83, Wesley complained that he could no longer write for more than 15 hours without his eyes hurting him, age of 83. And at the age of 86, he was ashamed that he could no longer preach more than twice a day, and he was really upset with himself really disturbed by his increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. Wesley knew from experience that usefulness invites blessing and happiness and joy, while uselessness invites disaster. Christ's encounter with the fig tree is meant to warn all of us that God created us for a purpose. God created us, every one of us, for a purpose. And to fulfill his purpose for our lives is to invite blessings. But to fail to fulfill it is to invite disaster. So I leave you with this question. In what ways are you fulfilling the purpose 
or the purposes for which God created you. Let's pray. Lord, it's not always obvious to us. But there was that day long ago when we emerged from our mother's womb and you breathed the first breaths of life into us. that was on purpose. Lord, help us to know how you would use our lives. And then help us to have the ability and the courage and the desire and the energy to live as you would have us live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in a, a wonderful hymn, Come Labor On, it's number 415 in your hymnals.
come to God in prayer this morning, let us remember the folks who are on the uh, prayer list. Bridget Boyd, Harry and Dorothy Springer, Randy, who continues to deal with cancer and treatment for that. Dory, also uh, dealing with cancer. Sophia W, home and doing well. Nadina, dealing with cancer. Sa Sandy Long, who is released from Mount Macrania and home. Arch B, James J. Uh, pending surgery. Also let us remember uh, Claudia uh, Atkinson who is dealing with illness. Let us pray together. What a challenge and what a privilege that wonderful hymn gives to us Lord. That you invite us to come and to labor for you to labor in your vineyard, as the Bible says. You call us to be your servant people. You call us to reach out to those who are hurting. You call us to minister th to those who are sick. You call us to care for those who are lonely and alone. You call us to come and labor, Lord in your name. What a challenge that is when our natural tendency is to labor for ourselves. But what a privilege it is, Lord, to serve you. Lord, help us to be your people here at Trinity Church. Help us to see the needs that are around us the homeless, the addicted, the struggling. Lord, help us to be your people and to touch those lives. Lord, we pray for these folks that we mentioned earlier as they struggle with illness, as they face surgery, as they, as they deal with that scary word, cancer, and as they receive treatments in one of its many forms. Lord, be with them in these times, and be with them in these times, and give them your strength and your encouragement and your healing power, Lord. Touch their lives with your presence and with your love. We pray too, Lord, for those who have lost loved ones, friends and family members who have had people that have lost those battles. Comfort them, Lord, in their grief and in their sadness. Give them strength and your peace. Be with us, Lord, in the week that is ahead. Draw us close to yourself. Help us not to walk out those doors and say, well, that's for another week. But help us to walk close to you. For the price that you paid for our salvation. The price that you paid that we might have eternal life. It's amazing. Help us not to forget that. Now, Lord, hear us as we pray together the prayer that like Jesus prayed with his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Thank you. hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If like to make a call, Give us this day our right daily again. bread if you need help, hang and up forgive and us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us continue worshiping God as we come to him with our gifts and our offerings. We know, O oh God, that words without actions are less than complete. As we confess Jesus as our Savior, we commit our lives to your care. Enable us to serve you with boldness, enlivened by the promise of your non-ending presence. Accept the gifts we offer as signs of our devotion. Amen.
Now let us go into the world in peace, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.